How you doing guys? I'm just going to talk a little bit about this book uh, called Natural Symbols by Mary Douglas. It was a book which was published in the 1970s. And uh, this book, I'd say, isn't a uh, very popular one in terms of its distribution within the general public and general audience. It's a more specific book related to anthropology, uh, social sciences, and sort of cultural analysis in general. Um, <clears throat> so I don't expect it to have a wide readership. Um, I don't expect most people to know about it. I wouldn't expect most people to know about it. Um, however, if you're a student of anthropology, if you're an, an individual who follows these disciplines, such as social science and religious ideas, uh, I'm sure you would have came across this book somehow, or at least heard of this book, or at least been referred to this book in some way, uh, especially because it's been out since the 1970s. So um, I, I would assume in, in colleges and in universities, the book has been mentioned at least once or a few times. Uh, so, um, but saying that it, is, it isn't for the general audience, um, and, and you'll, you'll see this if you read the book, because the language is a bit technical. Uh, there is a certain level of sort of prerequisite knowledge and a certain uh, level of uh, foundational kind of uh, language which you need and, and an understanding of, of certain terms and, and definitions before you can get really into the, into the nitty gritty of this book and understand it. <clears throat> and, and by saying this, I'd say that students of anthropology, uh, social science and, 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 and culture in general um, are probably the best fit to understand and interpret this book um, to its fullest degree. Uh, myself, I'm not one of those students, you know, I'm simply interested in these ideas and these topics. Um, so even, you know, so I didn't myself find um, myself stuck at certain t at certain points and having to refer to other books and whatnot um, to understand what was really going on. But with that being said, it's not a book, for example, it's not, it's not something such as Hegel, you know, or Heidegger, where the, the language is so dense and 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 and, and, and uh, difficult to penetrate that you're just lost for words and it takes you a whole year of reading, you know, uh, a single book. It's not that at all. It's simply that um, it would help that you had some background knowledge and some baggage in, in, in anthropology. And especially that you have a general interest in it. You know, it's not a book where you can just pick up and, and read uh, um, if you're just bored one day and then hope to understand it. Okay. Uh, it's a book which is related to specific ideas and specific lines of thought. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I was going through a secondhand book fair one day and just looking through books and what I can pick up for a good price and looking through all the names and whatnot and I came across this one and it said natural symbols so uh, at the time I was interested in symbolism and the way symbolism is influencing our culture and the way it has influenced our culture but, um, the way uh, symbolic forms uh, represent themselves in, in, in media and whatnot. So you know, symbolism in general, you know, so I picked this book up because I, I read the word symbol, thought, okay, well, what's a natural symbol? You know, what, what does that really mean? I was curious, okay. Um, <clears throat> so I read the book, I would, I read the blurb and the blurb read, you know, I, I, I will read it out to you guys right now. It said, every natural symbol derived from blood, breath or excrement carries a social meaning. And this work focuses on the ways in which any one culture makes its selections from body symbolism. Each person treats his body as an image of society. And Mary Douglas examines the varieties of ritual and symbolic expression and the patterns of social ritual in which they are embodied. Now reading that blurb, I thought, okay, well, um, maybe this is going to talk about uh, the use of blood, the use, the use of excrements and urine. Um, saliva and whatnot and how that's been represented and and, and uh, portrayed and utilized by different societies different cultures throughout history and, and even currently the way we view it you know maybe we see as excrement um, as being a dirty filthy thing which just needs to be disposed of whereas other cultures may see it as in, in terms of um it, it may see it in a religious light. It may have some sort of ritualistic purpose, you know. I was just curious about those type of questions, okay? So, th therefore, I, put, I picked the book up and I decided to, you know, give it a crack. And uh, now that I've read the book, I can confidently say that, <laughs> and I don't want to come off as being uh, arrogant or I don't want to come off too, in too harsh of a light. However, I feel as though the person who read this blog, who wrote this blog, maybe uh, may have not have actually read uh, the book itself, okay? Because... What I've taken from this book and what I really believe the book is about is, is the way religious ideas uh, influence the structure of certain cultures, societies, and how that uh, underlying foundation and um, a structure then influences the behaviors of individuals in that society. So it's the relationship between cosmologies, views of the cosmos, views of the universe, uh, and uh, sort of the relation between religious ideas in a, in a society 
and their and their and their influence on individuals uh, in that society, and in essentially the whole uh, trickling down effect of the, the in terms of the way that cosmologies inform and then um, organize the structure of a society, which then trickles down into the individuals. That's what I believe the book is about. It says it's a book about religion. I think it is. It's a book about religion and cosmologies. In particular, like I said before, you know, I just want to I, I just want to stress this a little bit. Is that it, it's a book which discusses and uh, analyzes and talks a little bit about the ways in which a society uh, looks at the world, looks at the cosmos, interprets the cosmos, and then based on this interpretation, organizes certain religious forms, religious uh, um, ideas certain religious principles, how it takes this information from the world and how it sort of seems to understand and how, how, how it uses, how, how it tries to understand uh, this or massive organization, this, this chaos, you know, how, and then had this understanding then uh, determines the sort of rules, the, 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 the rituals, the, the practices in the culture. And then these rules and practices and, 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 expectations are then taken upon the individuals and they inform their actions their behaviors their moralities okay how they interact with one another how potentially things such as sex such as birth such as relationships money you know um the 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 conquest uh, for power uh, the, the the struggle between um the family members how essentially the the the, the very um interactions within a culture how these interactions are determined, shaped, and uh, imposed upon by the religious structure and the cosmology of that culture. So that's a very, very interesting idea. At least me personally, I found it very interesting. Um, one one question which will never go away, which continually needs analysis is, or one of the questions, I suppose, because it opens up a whole another bag of questions, is why does an individual act the way he does? And why does he hold certain morals? Why does he hold certain principles? Uh, why does he view the world in a certain way? Why does he treat others the way he does? Okay, uh, and 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 what? And then taking that uh, up another level is, uh, well, what are the cultural influences upon this individual's behavior? Right. So, uh, what is it? What are the certain laws and structures and expectations and taboos of that culture? You know, how do they determine the behavior of the individual? So it's going up certain levels, you know, an individual to the group, the group, this relation to the universe, to the cosmos, cosmology. Now, this is the word which Mary Douglas repeatedly uses, it's cosmology, right? So I think it's a very, very representative term. It's, an, it's a good term which, which defines overall uh, um, certain levels of spirituality, certain levels of, of religion. Um, now... Uh, so this question needs continual analysis, continual continual investigation, because uh, it, certain groups which view the world differently, view the cosmos differently, seem to have different uh, organizations within their culture, within their, with the different structures within their society. And the way that this is explained is that uh, Mary takes a dive through history. It goes back and she takes examples of different cultures, different tribes, societies, and then she uh, determines whether that culture was a secular one, whether it was a highly sort of rigid religious one. And then she uh, seems to then uh, explain the certain behaviors of the individuals based upon their religious religious sort of foundation. Um, for an example, which stuck to me was the example of the highly secular tribes in Africa. Um, I, I believe it was from Guinea, if, if my memory serves, serves me correctly. And... So these tribes in Guinea, they're a very, very, very secular tribe, a very, very secular culture. So they don't have these sort of authoritarian figures. They don't have these interventionist deities, these multiple gods, which intervene and determine and shape their lives, right? They're, more, they're, 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 they're much more of a sort of grounded and organic uh, sort of culture, if I can put it in those terms, in which, um, in which things sort of seem to go the way they go in, in a free floating type of way. Uh, they, there isn't much external intervention in terms of taboos and whatnot. And because of this, uh, the culture is seen as more, as more uh, loose, okay? It's less, it's, it's less rigid. It's more free-flowing. Individuals jump between groups uh, much more freely. They traverse different groups, traverse different organizations, multiple partners, multiple sexual partners. Uh, so they, 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 they view the interactions, they view behaviors quite differently because 
their conception of the universe is quite different. They, the things which they put weight upon, the things which govern their morality, okay, um, these things are different than they are for a Christian or Islamic uh, culture, organization, not organization, sorry, um, group. So um, that was fascinating, you know, because a lot of times we seem to associate the West as being this secularized and modern culture. And, and of course it may be. Um, however, it uses examples through history saying, well, you know, it's not, it's not the only secular culture. There has been many, there has been secular cultures and, and these secular cultures in, uh, acted in these type of ways. And they thought, they thought of the world in these specific ways and they treat each other in these ways. And, and, and she believes at least is that the, the reason why their behaviors emerged the way they did and, wh and why they had these behaviors was because their underlying cosmology was a specific type. You know, it was a secular one. It wasn't one governed by uh, an, an, an external sort of order and a judgment. So contrasting this then to then another, another society, another culture, for example, a, a Christian one in which there is a God which, which determines uh, the way you should act, who can intervene, which judges you, a sort of, a, a sort of a authoritative figure in some sense. Um, at least that's one in, in conception of Christianity, of course. There are many, many interpretations of it even a percent potentially Islamic interpretation then, um, an Islamic culture in which there's a, there's a certain rigid form, rigid guideline, and then the, the society views the universe in this way. And because they view the universe, because they have a specific cosmology, uh, they have specific behaviors, which then determine the relations between the individuals in that culture, right? So you can, you can kind of see this trickle down effect once again. How does the individual act? Why does he act? Does he act the way he does because the society, because the culture itself views the universe in a specific way? <clears throat> so she uses these examples, these contrasts uh, throughout society. And it's, and, it's, and it's very interesting, you know, because it, it, it puts things in perspective and it shows you that there's a much, much more, uh, there are more things in common uh, between our societies and there are differences, right? Even though, even though when you get down to the nitty gritty, there are still big differences, of course. Um, <clears throat> so, so uh, these ideas of purity, these ideas of of of, uh, of, um, of 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 the idea of the sacred, you know, how do these differ between societies? And um, uh, one thing which I really liked about this book was that Mary didn't put any sort of value judgments on these different cultures. She wasn't saying one is better than the other. This one is 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 is, is superior. This one is, is 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 inferior. This one is is lacking this. Right? She sort of instead just painted a little picture of what was going on the cosmology of the culture the interactions of individuals from the culture and then she may she may have put had some points on on why they may have acted a certain way the sort of um, um, uh, constraints which governed that culture so taking it a little bit further from this book uh, one of the great questions then is well what are the biological constraints on the emergence of a culture because you have this sort of dichotomy of course between nature and nurture always and it doesn't seem to want to go away even though i think it's a sort of false dichotomy because the two things are so uh, contingent upon one another you know that things go back and forth from nurture to nature and, and nurture influences the expression of, of, of a nature and nature then influences the, you know certain limits on on nurture on, on a culture so one thing which would be really interesting with, 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 was then would be then to uh, sort of do a um, biological analysis of the constraints which govern the emergence of a specific culture. You know, because everyone needs to eat. You know, everybody needs to procreate. You know, everybody needs to get water and whatnot. There are certain biological limits even within a culture. You know, she's not saying that a culture can be anything it wants. You know, based upon the way it views the universe. Of course, we're all. Um, constrained in certain ways and limited in certain ways, which is perfectly normal. Uh, she she also talked a little bit about these um, neighboring tribes, for example, the Noir and uh, Dinka tribes in South Sudan, and the way that even though they're quite close in close proximity, they're, they're bordering tribes, they're quite regionally specific. Um, their, their their cosmologies are quite different, and their behaviors therefore are quite different as well. Um, so she talked a little bit about those. This is that, that was quite interesting as well. Um, one of the main ideas in this book, which I really appreciated, which 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 when, which she introduced was this idea of um, the individual's relation to the group. Okay, and I, I'm not entirely sure if this is her original idea because 
she is a student of Durkheim. She lists Durkheim repeatedly, and, and Durkheim is regarded as sort of this um, father of sociology. Oh, sociology, sorry. yeah, sociology, sorry. social sciences, that's right. Uh, <laughs> got confused with socialism. But Durkheim is regarded as the sort of father of social science, yeah? And she refers to him many times. She refers to also another famous anthropologist, uh, Levi Strauss, who um, is uh, regarded as a sort of structuralist uh, cultural anthropologist. <clears throat> so she refers to these two individuals, these two heavyweights of, of sociology, uh, quite repeatedly. So I'm not entirely sure if, if her ideas are entirely original. Of course, it's not it's beyond the point. You know, she's not claiming that they're original. She's sort of just presenting an argument in this book. So it would be fascinating to go back to Durkheim, read Durkheim, see what he says it has to say about these things and, and see where she got her ideas from, of course. And many times she does refer to Durkheim, you know, she's not being dishonest. Um, so she uses Durkheim many times, references him, and um, uh, it would be a good good thing to do. Uh, one, one, one good thing to do would be to read Durkheim and then go back to his book as well and see maybe uh, if you understand the, a little bit better. And this is why I say that students of anthropology, the social sciences may interpret this book in, in a different light um, than the way I did. <clears throat> so yeah, going back to this a core idea of what uh, Mary Douglas introduced in this book, what, one that I really appreciated is, is this uh, idea of the relationship between the individual and the group, right? Because um, individuals, whether we like it or not, we are determined by our uh, group, uh, our, our, our group, our commitment, the commitment to our group, okay, our group participation, you know, our sort of membership in our society, if you can put it in that way. So we may think that our behaviors are sort of independent completely and, and, and spontaneous and whatnot, and that we have a certain level of free will, uh, a certain level of free engagement. And of course, we have certain limit, cer certain levels of it, I think. However, um, uh, what's important to understand is that even our very behaviors, our conceptions of what we should do, you know, our principles and our moralities, they are determined by our 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 group's moralities and our and our, our group's morals, our group's principles, and our group's cosmology. Okay, um, I think fortunately we're we're, we're in, a, in a society where we allow the expression of various cosmologies, various individual worldviews, and we, we're able to sort of agree upon certain principles and, and then function within one another. That's why you can walk past a Christian, you can walk past a, a Buddhist, you can walk past a, an agnostic and even a socialist. And when you, if you want to stratify each other on, on these, on these, uh, on, on these levels and you can still get along with each other in certain, you know, you know you, there's no sort of conflict. We're, we're fortunate enough to live in a culture such as this. However, there are, there are places where deviation from the norm results in expulsion from the culture and you're done. You're done. You, know, you may even get killed. Who knows? However, your, your, your group membership is entirely dependent on holding the same values, virtues, approaches as, as the rest of the individuals in your group. So deviation is not seen as something which is recommended, right? Ah, okay, one second. I think my thing's gonna black out. So, we're fortunate enough to live in this this this, this kind of culture, and what uh, Mary helped me develop in, in my own thinking here is that uh, some other cultures themselves are very rigid, and they they don't necessarily allow this flexibility in thought and this freedom of thought in a certain way. Um, of course, even our, our own culture, every culture itself, every society itself, I think, you know, I believe, I could be wrong, you know, imposes limits, which, which you cannot simply transgress without resulting in expulsion. Of course, everyone holds, every culture, even our culture now, which is more free and democratic, and it still has certain things which you cannot transgress, certain limits, right? <clears throat> now, this idea of individual culture, this, these two, these two um, dualisms, right? individual and and, and, the, and, the, and the society and the membership of that individual within the group um, she's saying that you know the individual is is, is is stuck to that group to in a certain way but then he may start deviating he may start changing his cosmology changing his worldviews and then what could be a a, 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 a manifestation of neurosis of pathology of disease of, of trauma and and something which brings that individual a lot of grief is is the social pressures put upon him because he's breaking away from the group, okay? So he may be uh, um, stigmatized and and bullied and, and, and sort of um, 
told to get out and, and, and all these pressures, social pressures put upon the individual because he's deviating from the norm. He's essentially tearing himself away from the group. The individual is creating their own conception of the way they should live their life. And because they're doing this, uh, um, very so social pressures are being exerted upon him, right? And you can see this in a, in a very, very simple way, even within your own friendship circles or within groups you've been in before, within organizations, if you start having some, a flicker of independent thought, you may, get, you may get sort of banished straight away. You may get cut down and, and, and told, you know, that's, that's wrong, don't do that. And of course, people may not tell you directly, but you still have these social pressures being exerted in various implicit ways. And, 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 and I'm sure we can all relate to this. Now, it gets to a certain point where the individual can either uh, uh, take this social pressure, these social um, um, uh, sort of an, an negative attitudes, and then they can come back to the group, right? And the group, the, the group retains an individual. However, the individual may just stop caring about the opinions of these people and, and go their own way and then just essentially create their own um, group, their own cosmology, their own worldview. And then that, 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 that worldview, of course, um, results in different behaviors in the individual. And this is this has some sort of an analog in Darwinian speciation, where because you have geographical isolation of a species, uh, that they're separate, and then enough time uh, takes place, enough time uh, tr uh, transpires, and you have a new species emerging on the other side. <clears throat> okay, so I think I've I've said um, a lot here. <laughs> I don't want to go too much longer. Mary Douglas, Natural Symbols. It's a book about the emergence. Uh, not sorry. Let me go back. It's not about the emergence. It's a book about the, um, the 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 religious ideas of a culture. The way those religious ideas shape the structure of the culture, the inherent fun foundation of a culture, and then the ways in which the individual's behaviors within that culture are uh, dictated by this worldview, by this cosmology. Good book, uh, slightly technical, definitely recommended for people who are interested in language, symbolism, religion, uh, anthropology, and social science. If you just want to read a novel, you know, it's probably not the one, not, probably not the book to pick up, okay? <laughs> probably because it's not a novel, but uh, you're not going to find too much there that's going to take your mind away from, from things. Okay. Hope everyone has a great day and uh, keep reading and um, enjoy. Okay.